an excellent um, framework uh, um, used to be used by various authorities and governments and others in um, all across the world. So congratulations, Tom, to you, and of course to Emma and Amy and Lindsay and Emily, all of you. Uh, I found it extremely useful uh, document to go through. Um, and I think it would be used a lot and will make a difference. Um, my reaction to this particular framework, uh, future framework for DRR, was that, that I wanted to add to that and say that how this could be used more by the decision makers who will be using it and um, what are what will help them use it better, faster, more effectively. And from that perspective, I was looking at this particular document uh, that you have created. Um, so I wanted to move from DRR frameworks to its use by decision makers. Um, the frameworks per se do not necessarily get used as much as we want them to. So what matters are the decision makers and what makes them use the frameworks? The experience of both All India Disaster Mitigation Institute as well as CDKN work here in India shows that conversations, which includes debates, dialogues, discussions, and more arguments as well, around the frameworks make decision makers use them, use them better, faster, inventively. And that's what I want to talk about the kind of conversations that would go around this framework that we have created. The conversations are often latent, uh, that is not articulated, and when they are, they will use the views of the framework even better. To look at what kind of conversations would be useful to make this particular set of frameworks um, use better, I've done two things, two sources. One is I've drawn a lot from the CDK and zone engagement in India on the 14 uh, action research projects on CSDRN, that is Climate Smart Disaster Risk Management work. I've also drawn from CDK and current engagement in India on heat health uh, work that's being done in Ahmedabad city, uh, the hazard vulnerability assessment work that's being done in the Himalayas, the work on future proofing cities in South India, and also CDKN work with the partners and the authorities on district disaster management planning on River Ganga Bank and uh, on its banks. So that's one source from which I'm bringing the materials to present to you that what kind of conversations around this, these frameworks would be useful. And second is to look at uh, our own publication, SouthAsiaDisasters.net, which was launched at HFA, HFA1, if you can call it. And over the last 100 months, 100 issues have been published and um, um, 400, more than 500 contributions, local global voices on DRR. So that's another repertoire from where I'm taking out um, the material that I'm presenting. I think the first very useful conversation that will help decision makers use these frameworks is on livability. That is, we need to know and discuss far more about the risk and density of risk, for example, risk and boundaries, risk and land use, built environment, ecosystems. Tom just said there is module coming up on ecosystems and environment. We need to discuss more about risk and zoning, regulations, hierarchies of risk, how they interact and collide, and their relation to livability. Also conversations around um, knowing more about the social separation of risk to an extent it is discussed in uh, um, um, inclusion part, but more specifically, social separation of risk would be a good conversation to make decision makers think and pick up these frameworks and use. Also about risk and resilience in new urbanism, that is future proofing cities that we are retrofitting cities that we are talking about, and there it would be useful to have more conversation, discussions, debates around that. And last, that how do we tap the mixed use of urban vitality of fast-growing Asian cities to serve the resilience agenda? Con uh, 
conversations around that would help promote the framework that is created <clears throat> by ODI and CDKN. That's one conversation. Second conversation, I think, which would be very useful, discussion, debate, dialogues, arguments, if you will, would be around the territoriality. And first is that uh, the whole concept of territoriality in terms of national territoriality, city, subnational territoriality, must come that they should compete to attract mobile capital and investments. Now, how will that play vis-a-vis -vis the investment for disaster risk reduction? And then that's a major decision that decision makers are making and will be making. That is investment for disaster risk reduction measures, as well as disaster risk reduction to protect the investments that are coming to their cities, their countries, and their subnational regions. So that's one aspect of conversation around territoriality would be very useful. Second conversation, which would be very useful to make this framework <coughs> used more and better, would be to look at that what is an appropriate scale to address risk and how resilience unfolds regionalism, such as in the Delta areas, metropolitanism, such as the large coastal cities in Asia and elsewhere, how DRR decisions balance the tension between um, self-interest of at-risk citizens and their need to belong to. So these kind of conversations, discussions, debates would be very useful to make uh, the frameworks uh, more attractive, more usable. And third conversation, and that's the last uh, for this presentation, would be the conversations around reflection, sort of looking inward. That how do we look inward facing DRR per se? why some resist DRR measures and others do not, and we need to discuss this more in order to use these frameworks. Um, the whole approach of master DRR experts to DRR technician to at-risk citizens as foot soldiers of uh, DRR, and how is that going to work? That's something we need to look at more carefully. Um, maybe decision makers should abandon what is convention, what is general, meta frames and good practices as soon as they are invented? And that's a question. DRR decision makers should start to learn from their own actions more. Is there a time scope for that? Not from the average of their actions, but from the extremes, surprises, and how that could help them improve, do better for the next project, next program that they take up. DRR decision makers, um, do they need more reflection in action on the action itself or on the actions themselves? Uh, uh, that's a very useful conversation around this framework. And uh, let DRR goals be discovered, determined, modified along the way in the process of using these frameworks. So these are the three types of conversations. As example, I would like to draw from the AIDMI's own work, which is available through SouthAsiaDisasters.net and CDKN's projects that exist uh, um, are ongoing um, to present here. I think essentially to use these uh, frameworks more uh, in the field by decision makers is to enlarge the DRR tent, um, invite more recipients, more conversations, both institutions as well as individuals, and to ensure, basically, how to ensure equitable opportunities for DRR, how to democratize DRR decision making, and how to counter isolation and exclusion of at-risk citizens from resilience process that's unfolding. Thank you. Mihir, thank you very much. I think you've taken us very uh, beautifully from, from the guide to the use of the guide. Um, and now we really turn to the decision maker who's, who's here with responsibility for leading the UK's position on this. So that was, was love, uh, a very nice uh, presentation. And, uh, there's lots of food for thought and I'm sure people want to pick up on some of your points. So next, I'd, I'd like to turn to Steve Barnes, who, as I said, leads the UK uh, in the negotiations around HFA 2. You're from the Cabinet Office 
UK Civil Contingency Secretariat. Um, Stephen, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us.